hit me with some hooch, tea bag. Tea dog. Please, sir, may I have some beverage? Here. Help yourself. I'm busy. Oh my god, it's like Christmas! So this is episode six of the Mind Reels. I am Tim Rideau, sitting to my right this time. Yeah, my, on the left. My co-creator and co-creator partner, Sue Maynard. That's me. That is Hello. Me. And to her left, we have... No, wait, that would be me, I guess. <laughs> and so, back to me! <laughs> across the table. Yes, and across the table from me, we are sitting with Rick Howland, who is known for, uh, for Trick on Lost Girl, and uh, he's done a number of smaller projects, as well as uh, starring, well, co-starring in Bon Cop, Bad Cop, yep. one of my personal favorite Canadian movies. Sweet. <laughs> Hello. And then to his left, we have his wife, Nadia Bassett. Bassett? Hi. Bassett. 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 Yes. Excellent. Who's agreed to join us as well. So, uh, <laughs> Against your better judgment. <laughs> <laughs> So we're going to start with the easy questions, the kind of getting to know you questions. We always start with this one. Favorite movies? Desert Island movies. Favorite Desert Island movies? Oh, no. Favorite movies that you, you know, you have a list of oh, Desert Island Oh, take your Desert yeah. Island. So, I was going to say. <laughs> the uh, no, that wait, wait, Tom uh, Hanks. <laughs> yeah. With the ball, Wilson or something. That was okay. <laughs> Robinson Crusoe. Nice. Um, uh, favorite movies? Um... I went through a period where I really, really enjoyed. Uh, no, I'm not going to remember the writer's name. <laughs> the guy, Kaufman. Andy, no, Andy, Andy Kaufman? Not oh, Andy no. Kaufman. Uh, um, Philip Kaufman. Lloyd? No. Adaptation was one of them. Yes. Uh, yeah, he's doing a new one now, too. Is he? Yeah. Oh, it's got to be good. They're, They're all right. cerebral. Yeah. That's the kind of film I enjoy a lot. I don't know. It's, there's always elements. I, I don't think I have like a, a list of favorite films. There's actors I like. There's directors I like. There's writers I like. There's films I like. There's genres I like. And it's kind of, oh, if I have to. You know, if I have <laughs> yeah, to. I, yeah. It's like, just give me something that I can watch more than once. My friend made me one time. <laughs> Make that list? It had to be top ten. It had to be in order. <laughs> I was like, wow. Almost in tears. Oh, I'm see, like, I, I had to bump Lady yeah. Hawk off. <laughs> 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 but Princess Bride needed to be on. <laughs> Watched District oh, 9 close. last night again. Really? What a great film yeah. that is. I like that one. I was uh, fascinated watching it, kind of trying to uh, keep in mind watching it, because it's a documentary style, right? And mm -hmm. I'd seen, we'd seen the interviews about it and the making of at one point, and they talked about it, you know, trying to make a film as cheaply as possible. Because you, you know you're dealing with South Africa, you're dealing with Johannesburg, and and the elements that are all around there, and the political state and everything else. The film is a wicked reflection of, oh, yeah. of South Africa. Yeah. I just really enjoyed following the the way the film used the documentary genre, and then would seamlessly go into that into the moments where it felt yeah. like a feature film, where you're actually not watching through the TV screen mm, yeah. or yeah. through the other <laughs> eye. You're actually in there with them in that moment where a gun's pointed at somebody's head and they have to, you know, confess something or whatever. Yeah. And I just, I really enjoy it. I don't really enjoy films anymore as so much as like You're watching, them as a watching maker? all these yeah. different things. Just the elements are like watching a performance because I really am impressed by that actor and mm -hmm. want to figure out what they're doing or what they're thinking about when they're yeah. doing that thing. And yeah, see, we met, we've so, yeah. heard that with, uh, with uh, the interview we did last week with, uh, with a young actress named Emily. Who, uh, who said, yeah, it's on her off time now, she doesn't watch a lot of television or movies anymore because that's what she does for a living. It's kind of like if you work in retail, you don't want to go shopping afterwards. You don't, you don't <laughs> really want to be exposed to more of it. Like, I certainly don't want to watch job. other people yeah. work yeah. in retail. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maddie, do you have a favorite? Underwritten. <laughs> Good. Excellent nice choice. <laughs> <laughs> Which was a great little film. It was. But we've got that to talk about yep. as well, yeah. So how did, you, how did you get into film and television? Well, through the acting route, I mean... In grade 12, I think it was, I was told by a guidance counselor or whomever that I needed to get an art credit in order to graduate. Because you needed the art credits as well. And I hadn't taken any art. I was uh, destined for working with my hands in wood or computers or cars or something. I was in that kind of world. And so then I uh, had to take an art credit. I'm not really actually very good at drawing things. And so I thought, well, okay, I'll, I'll try this acting thing then. This, and, you know, a friend of mine who was kind of a, more of a sporty jock kind of guy said, yeah, man, it's easy. It's like, you know, you, you pretend to be a cloud. It's, it's like simple, and you get a credit for it. It's, it's nothing. It's like you, you're a cloud, or you're a bird, and you run around the room, and 
they give you a mark for it. So <laughs> it's great. I'm like, okay, fine. So I'll, I'll take the I'll take the, the acting course. And the very first class I had, Madame Belanger, who was my uh, drama teacher for that first year, said, uh, okay, everyone, close your eyes and imagine yourself in a room in a cobblestone, you know, or, uh, in a room, and you got a ball in your hand. There's a there's a window in the room. Throw the ball at the window. I closed my eyes, and I was in a room that I'd never been in my life. There was a one of those rubber balls, which I won't call it the regular the term that we used to call it when I, in the 70s, but a rubber ball <laughs> with the red and the white and the, the, the blue stripe, yeah. or the white stripe, the red yeah. and the blue and the, we, you know, a racist name that we used to call it, but um, <laughs> anyway, I had that ball, and I, uh, I looked out the window, and I was in a room, like I'd, I, I left my body, and I went into this room, and I had the ball, the ball was in my hand, I looked out the window, there was a cobblestone street that I have still to this day I've never seen in reality. I don't know where it came from, where like I manufactured it or whatever. Threw the ball out the window and I watched it bounce down the street and roll into the culvert. And she said, okay, everyone open your eyes. Okay, now everyone, I want you to watch Rick. Rick, do it again. And I was like, do it again? What do you mean <laughs> do it again? But I already threw the ball. <laughs> yeah, I, I did it. I'm done. She said, do it again and have when everyone watch Rick. So I closed my eyes and there was nothing but blackness behind my eyelids. And I was like, oh, okay, what do I do now? There's blackness, okay, so what do I do? Okay, so I saw a room, and there was a window in the room, and I, and I looked at my hand, because there was a ball in my hand, and, I, and then I held the ball up, and I threw it out the window, and then I watched it go, and bounced down. So I manufactured what I had seen that first time through. So then years later, and she said, great, okay, everyone, you see what he did, you know, you could see him actually throw the ball, you could see him see the ball roll down the street. I think that was the point, because mm. I, I seemed to, I noted that my head should kind of bounce <laughs> to indicate to them, the viewer, that there's a ball, that I'm watching a ball bounce, because my eyes are closed, yeah. you know. Thinking about it, you know, years later, and well, and that, and that moment was like, Viper of theater jumps up and bites me on the neck, and it was <laughs> over, I was done, right? It was like, people are watching me, people are staring at me, they're looking at me, and they're not pointing. They're actually paying attention to what I'm doing. They're giving me respect with looking at me. And that, be, that was a huge shift for me. And so I became an actor, much to my father's chagrin. <laughs> but, but don't it's you want to keep... The father. <laughs> try, try the computers a bit more. Try, try the... Yeah, the computer science sucks. It's hard. I'm caught before next loop, Dad, okay? Um, <laughs> then I started doing acting there, and then a guy came to our high school that year or the next year doing Improv Olympics out of, the, out of Ottawa. I remember that. He got us doing a team, which me and five other people did, and I did that for two years and then graduated away. I got bit right away, like immediately when I first took theater class, and then I was, it, I was done. I was literally, it was like there was nothing else I would do, and I will do, and it was like all the other doors just kind of went, How many nope, art credits can I get? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then years later, when I was at York for a year, only a year. <laughs> <laughs> Go to university only for the piece of paper, people. You don't need it to learn how to be an artist. I was reading Stanislavski's My Life in Art as a prerequisite for acting class, and reading him, reading about him, trying to, you know, become Hamlet and identify it with a character and so or an animal, and so he's. Re I was reading a passage about him tearing apart his dorm room, being the tiger that is in within Hamlet. I think that's the right story. Anyway, <laughs> and, he's, and he's, he's realizing, he realizes that because he had he adorned some of the costume that he was allowed to take home with him, that it was, that costume was helping him find that character. Mm -hmm. And and he, and through that, those reflections, he wrote the whole idea of inside out and outside in. And that's when it clicked in my head that my very first moment experience acting, I had inside out and then had to do outside in in the next beat because there was no images in my head that she told me to recreate this moment and I was like, how do I recreate it when I can't mm -hmm. immediately jump back into that place? That even cemented it more for me. It was kind of like, okay, this means that you know I was right place, right time, whatever. Mm -hmm. Lightning bolt of karma or whatever you want to call it. So, Karma, kismet. Kismet. Serendipity. Serendipity, exactly. <laughs> But while you were at York, or shortly after, you formed a comedy troupe. 
At York. At York. The four yeah. trombones. The four trombones, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and can you tell us about them? Yeah, originally, because the four trombones doesn't make any sense to anybody, but originally the name was the four trombones in search of a strumpet. A strumpet, <laughs> awesome. being, a strumpet being a prostitute in Shakespearean language. Yeah. So uh, my friend Paulino Nunes, I believe it was him that actually coined, coined it, Strombones, because it's the male equivalent to a strumpet. <laughs> so we were four of Strombones in search of a strumpet. And we could actually never get a strumpet to perform for us, or at least <laughs> no women wanted to be called a strumpet on stage. Fancy we couldn't figure that. it out. Yeah, we're that happen. I don't understand that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we never really got a, a female character until, or a female actor to, to join our troupe until much later when we did a critically acclaimed theater production for the Fringe Festival in, when was that, 96? Something like that called 40 Minutes After Midnight, In Transit, In Transit. We thought, In Transit, what a great name for a, a play. <laughs> Turned out there was another play I had written in the same title in that wow. particular year of Fringe Festival. So we had to go, okay, well then, In Transit, 40 Minutes After Midnight was the name of our, in our, you know, history of having things with two long titles. <laughs> <laughs> Force trombones in search of a trumpet. <gasps> Run out of air. So, in Transit, 40 Minutes After Midnight. <gasps> But anyway, I went to York. I'd been doing improv uh, Olympics and met this, actually, this, it was this woman, Alyssa Horscroft, technician, still to this day, somewhere in, in the country. She uh, was a year ahead of me at York, and she said, oh, you've got to talk to Brad Borbridge. Brad Borbridge is an improv guy, and he's from Ottawa. I was like, oh, okay, so that's from my school of thought, so I'll talk to him. So I, I had a meeting with Brad, and he was like, yeah, we should do this. And so then he pulled in two guys from his year as well, so it was three guys from the year ahead of me and me. And Scott Duchesne, who is now teaches at Guelph, I believe. Man, I wish I was a university, if I was a university, I'd go, to, I'd go and be taught by him. He was the funniest guy. I, I, you know, I learned a lot from Scott Duchesne, and a brilliant writer, and just, okay, well him, him and Paulino, <laughs> when, I was in, when I was there for that one year, they were in second year, like I said, they had, a, they had an apartment together, Scott and Paulino. And there was a there was another place uh, off campus <clears throat> where a bunch of a uh, bunch of the women actresses from that from that same year all lived together, and it was called Babe Central because <laughs> all these beautiful <laughs> girls and they, they were they were happy. It was a, a happy name used by everyone, <laughs> and uh, it wasn't sexist. It was like you know these babes. And uh, Paul and Scott's place was called Existential Existential Central on a riff off of that. And, and it was true. I mean, they were very existential dudes, and uh, to this day they still are. Yeah, so that was the first incantation of the Forest Rome Bones. It was the first kind of uh, way we worked. And we mainly did improv and stuff like that for the first couple of years. And Scott would write the odd sketch, or I'd write the odd sketch. And, but mainly we did improv. In that first year, too, actually, we, the fourth years that year, which was like uh, Mark Huseman, Todd Hammond, Joe Kilmartin, most forgetting uh, Mike, Mike. He's in Bang No, he's in LA now. Anyway, you know our peers. These and they were much bigger than me. Ever actually, everyone's still much bigger than me. But <laughs> then it was really they seemed a lot bigger. And we did a we did a, like a there was an an arts festivaly thing that they did every year. And and so we had a competition, an improv competition with those fourth year guys. They were mission improbable. And, <laughs> and we were the four strong bones. And we did like an improv off with them and. It was one of the highlights of actually of my my time doing doing the improv with the four awesome. uh, competing against those guys because it was you know a lot of fun and they were all acting kind of like well we're in fourth year kind of cocky or whatever <laughs> and we were doing shots of tequila in the bar before going up to do improv because we wanted to freak them out so we <laughs> did a shot of tequila which I think it worked anyway we went on and we we did that for about three or four years and then Scotty went away and. We picked up a guy named Roddy Muir for a while. He's, he's British, and uh, he was a very funny guy. So then it was four of us for a while, and then it turned into Paul, Lena, Paul, and myself and, and Roddy for quite a few years. And then it kind of, I don't know, it, it kind of slid, slowed down as the new millennium approached. I mean, we all, Roddy's a punk musician, and he's kind of put his funk focus on that. And Paulino put his focus more into acting, and so and I did as well. It was time to earn a living more or try to earn more of a living because really you know sketch comedy I mean nowadays I bet it pays 
you know, mar marginally more than it did then, but it wasn't. But you've also done Bon Cop, Bad Cop. You played the really badly named Harry Butman. Harry Butman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's like, that's an unfortunate name. Yeah, well, I spent most of the film in the trunk of a car. So. And in a bag. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that was a whole, that was um, Patrick Huard's whole riff on the FLQ yeah. scenario. But yeah, no, that was, a, that was, a, that was interesting. I, I auditioned for that. I literally got a call from my agent said, you've got this audition for this thing. So I got sent these sides, the sides of the scripts that you get that aren't the full script, or it's just, actually it might not even be the script that you're going to be shooting, it's just an example of dialogue that they can hear you to see if you can act. It was one of the scenes that actually didn't end up making it into the film, which is another funny story about that, which I'll tell you in a minute. But, uh, so I go into the audition, and it was at uh, Central Casting on uh, Young Street, Walked upstairs and you know hanging out with a bunch of other people. I walk into the room and it was just two young guys. They looked like my friends from when I was in university, kind of <laughs> at, you know younger than me. And they're just like, yeah, okay, so we're, you know I'll read with you and we're just gonna run the camera and we'll just do this. And I was like, cool. So we did it. And I was like, great, thanks. And I was like, okay, because like you know sometimes there's a producer and a director in the room or sure. sometimes there's not sometimes it's just a casting director sometimes it's just a couple of guys who are putting people on film and it goes back and then gets looked at yeah, yeah. so it goes away it gets looked at I forget about it literally it was like a month a month and a half later I get a call it's like yeah you remember that film you auditioned for it's like it was a film <laughs> what was it I auditioned for that thing you auditioned oh yeah yeah you got it and I'm like really she's like yeah and you fly to Montreal Really? Yeah, just for a fitting. Really? <laughs> yep. And it's like, what? Why? Well, well, you're playing, uh, you know, this the commissioner of the hockey league, and da -da -da -da. I'm like, really? <laughs> I'll stop saying really in a minute, but I'm just kind of blown away. Three days later, I was flown to Montreal, literally for a suit to be made, and I still have that suit because they gave it to me, which was very nice of them. Uh, <laughs> it, it, would, it wouldn't fit anybody else anyway. And uh, it's a good suit. <laughs> and it's a great suit. I've worn it. I've worn it to several weddings and. Funerals and bar mitzvahs and whatnot. Um, but, uh, so it's got its use. The guy who was fitting me was Italian and French, but didn't speak English. And I don't speak French or Italian, despite people ask me. It's like, you look Italian. Do you speak Italian? Like, no, I don't. Do you speak French? Like, no, no. Which is unfortunate. And I apologize for, to, the, to all the French-speaking Canadians. I, I felt the cracks in high school and didn't quite get the education that they were trying to teach us. A lot of us did. It bothered me actually that, oh, I guess it didn't bother me enough to actually learn the language by now. <laughs> Slap my hand. But um, it did bother me at the time when I was shooting in Montreal that I couldn't understand people very well. I got better at it, but still. And I was back and forth a lot. Like, I flew um, 11 times back and forth to, to do the movie. I got the part and ended up flying back and forth a bunch of times. The first weekend I flew there, it was like my first taste of kind of a large, I mean, they were, it wasn't called a large budget movie. If you looked at my contract, it wasn't called a large budget movie because <laughs> they have categories. But it was a pretty big deal. And oh, I got there on that first weekend or first two-day trip or whatever, and I didn't even get shot. Like, I, I didn't even get shot on camera. It was, I flew there, I got into my costume, got the wig glued to my head, stood around on set. And an enormous stunt took a little bit longer. And they're like, oh, well, we're not going to get to you today. <laughs> Fly back to Toronto. Wow. <laughs> okay, sure, no problem. But it was uh, directed by uh, Eric Canul, who I've had the opportunity to work with again since. Nice. He directed the first episode of season one of Lost Girl. Oh, wow. And he's awesome. I, I would, I would uh, I'd do anything for him again. Uh, he's a great director, really, really passionate, passionate man. Really made me feel very, very comfortable on set there in Montreal, and as did everybody. In the trunk of the car? Yeah, in the trunk of the car. Oh yeah, and then, so then I, uh, you know, I'm pretty excited and a little bit nervous about that one. I had this like big monologue scene where I get to yell at Patrick Huard and, and yeah. Colin yeah. Fiore, and it's like, I'm going to get to yell at Colin Fiore? <laughs> By the way, for anybody casting agents who are listening, I think we kind of look alike and you could cast us as brothers. But anyway. Totally. Uh, totally. Uh, so that's why they, I, think, I think that's why they put a wig on me, too, just because it's just like, oh, he looks yeah. a little too much like Colin. <laughs> and I was actually hoping that they're going to make a, a, a second one where, I, you know, where they have to you know, kind of do the Joe Pesci story where I, I stay in the back seat rather than the trunk this time, maybe. 
and get to deliver funny lines from the back seat. But anyway, um, I go into the craft truck while I'm waiting to shoot, and, and Colin comes in, and it's like, oh, hi, nice to meet you. He's like, oh, hello, nice to meet you. And we have a lovely chat, and he says, yeah, it's too bad about that scene that got cut. I was like, what scene? He goes, yeah, that one with the monologue, that you had that monologue in. <laughs> no, it got caught. He goes, oh, am I telling you for the first time? I was like, yeah. Like, Sorry. I'm like, that's okay. I'm going go to go back to my little trailer and sit and cry about my lost monologue. But it was a, it was a wicked experience, all in all. Now, but you don't only act, you're also a singer-songwriter. I am, And you've done two bit. albums, you've done uh, Space for Rent and live, live Off the Floor. Live Off the Floor. I want to say Live Off the Floor. Live, yeah. Sound, yeah. Like and a recording live. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm impressed that you actually have those yeah, right now. I, I listened to them this morning, as a matter of fact. Really? <laughs> yeah. Right on. And uh, then you just did... Uh, you shot a music video on a Palm Pilot. Yeah, we did, yeah, for yeah. a competition. Uh, train, uh, no, Like a Train. Like a Train. Which is, I like that. I like that song a lot. And you, cool. Yeah, and you do, like, harmonica, guitar. Harmonica, guitar, sing. And then my friend Taryn played bass and uh, lead guitar. Nice. Now, is there any hope that there's, like, another album forthcoming at any point? Uh, I have at least another album or two of songs that I've written over the years. Yeah, at some point. I kind of go in and out of it. I mean... Throughout my life, I used the songwriting kind of as a way of cathartically getting out crap that I was dealing with, another creative outlet when acting wasn't happening or things were slow or whatever, and I'd end up going out. And, but I find, uh, and also I find uh, performing music and singing absolutely terrifying. I find it way more terrifying than actually performing and acting, like, you know, doing the force your own bones. Than improv. You know, improv <laughs> you know, somebody says, take off your pants in front of a, a 35 people. Not a problem. A hundred people, not a problem. I'll take my pants off. It's like, look at my yeah, underwear, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Put a guitar and a harmonica and make me sing. I need a week's rehearsal and, and like, you know, sol solitary confinement a for a couple of days. Ahead of time. <laughs> just to kind of, yeah, it's like, it, it terrifies me. It's just, for some reason, I don't know why. And I've been, you know, over the years trying to kind of break that, break that down. Mm -hmm confront that fear but I haven't done it enough to really get over it entirely and so it's like it's still you know whenever I go and I perform it's it's always a, a completely nerve-wracking tear my heart out kind of sweat inducing kind of thing and that's why I ended up putting out albums just kind of like recording them because it's like well I gotta record these just so I can have them yeah but there, there's there, there'll definitely be more recording down the road the video you mentioned uh, like a train my friend Steve Simeon who actually was the DOP on on underwritten we, somebody had sent this link to me, or somebody told me about this. There was a Yahoo competition, music video competition. So I called them and I said, "Hey, we're not doing anything. Why don't we make one of my songs a music video? So how do we shoot it? What do you got camera-wise?" He goes, "I think we should do it on my little my phone." And it was like way before iPhones. This was like 2002, maybe, maybe a little later, four, 2004. It was an old, old camera phone. We agreed that it would be a cool, grainy look, mm -hmm. and so let's do that. And he was living up north a bit, so really close to the train tracks. Like a Train was kind of my favorite song at the time, I like it a lot, yeah. and uh, and it, it's just kind of the most I don't know, it's kind of the most accessible story, kind of for songwriting or for audience to appreciate, I think. Rather than like the crying heart ones, it's like, <laughs> she won't love me! <laughs> Why won't she love me? <laughs> Screw that! <laughs> well, yeah, there, sucks. Was, well, there was one song on there that I heard this morning, um, I Miss You. Yeah. Which is very much kind yeah, of that. that feeling. Like, yeah, no, I mean, I, you know, people have asked me before about my songwriting, whether it's like, is that exactly from an experience or whatever? And there are from either individuals or from an individual experience. Oh, there you go that I've taken from that and then extrapolated a large one or ruminated on it or whatever you want to call it and created songs around incidences but nothing, hopefully nothing too specific where people can come back and get mad at me or sue me or anything. Often songs were written with someone or some event in mind. Of course. Well, they say write what you know, so it's yeah, always exactly. got to be something personal. Exactly. And you, you, know, you, know, you know, you start, and like I said, I kind of use it as a, a, a way of kind of dealing with my own stuff and so I would literally be in an emotional place first and so then pick up the guitar, the chords kind of come from the emotional place, the, the chord choices come from an emotional place and then 
playing that over and over again, and then you start singing stuff. And mm-hmm. True. Hopefully, stop in time to write it down and get the good stuff. <laughs> get it all down. <laughs> and then you guys, how did you both get involved in the Forty Eight Hour Film Fest? Uh, Nadia actually found yeah. it online. Um, she was looking for us, something for us to do. I mean, we're shooting we're shooting season two of Lost Girl right now, but there have been some periods where I'm down, and I think it was actually over a, almost before before or after the hiatus. It was right before the hiatus. So <clears throat> it timed out really well where the the film the forty hour film project was like right at the beginning of, of a hiatus for me and so it kind of it would have been better if at the end of that hiatus. But anyway, she'd wanna she wants to Nadia has done event planning for decades, or for at least a decade, over a decade. Isn't so interested in doing event planning for live events so much anymore, but all those skills kind of lend themselves to producing film. And so we thought that we thought that, that would be a this would be a good way to kind of dip our foot in the pool together as a producing couple or company yeah. or whatever. And to see if see what we could do and see if, you know, we're still married after it and, yeah. and uh, <laughs> And to see if it, uh, you know, all relationships survive it and what happens. And so, you know, from my improv experience and writing and stuff like that, I, I was like, yeah, sure, let's try it. Why not? Mm-hmm. And as long as I get to direct, <laughs> I think <laughs> nice. it's the first thing I said. I'd be happy to act in it and stuff like that, but I'd, I think I, I wanted to have a little more control, a little more hands-on to it. My best man for our wedding was, who's our DOP, and our other friend, Bernie, who... Uh, is learning editing and has been an editor for a little while and so it just seemed like the four of us should give it a shot. Rick and his friends have been saying for as long as I've known them, let's do this, let's make a movie, we should make a movie, we right. should make a movie. And I come across this competition, it's like, okay, so make a movie, put your money where your mouth is. <laughs> do it. 48 hours. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you don't put a deadline on it, right, they're going to spend the next 40 years saying, yeah, let's make a movie. <laughs> That's true. Hence yeah. the credit at the end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There we go. That's right. Yeah. And then on top of that, you guys walked away with four awards. Yeah. Yeah. It was, that was uh, pretty cool. Best costumes, I think. Yeah. For for our group, there were two two groups of screenings for the night. In our group, we won for um, best costumes, best ensemble acting, and best use of line of dialogue. And what was the dialogue? What's your What's, recommendation? Yeah. Okay. It's the last line of the film. <laughs> like yeah. Before, yeah. Like before he shoots him. Yeah. 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 And I would have put that line sooner if I could have, but I couldn't. <laughs> it was. It just fit right there. And Wait. then overall. Oh yes, right. Then overall. overall. Nice. Best yeah. line of dialogue. Yeah. Best use of line of dialogue. So nice. Again with the long titles. I don't win <laughs> yeah. anything with short titles. Well, and then there was the long and the short of it. Yeah. As well. Yeah. So are you guys going to do it again next year? No. Yeah. <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably not do the forty-eight hour film project again. Like, a, 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 not do a, a timelined one. Like a, but we will definitely work on something again. Nice. I, I'd really like to coach a team next year that wants to do it. Yeah. I think I've learned enough to, you know, want to help out mm-hmm. a fledgling team next Ooh. time. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. That would be cool. I mean, I was looking for information on how not to do it and right. there wasn't much out there yeah. and so anybody would want to do it I'd, I'd be willing to give yeah. them tips for sure but I don't want to do it again <laughs> that, and I've learned what I needed to yeah very so and, but I, what you did find was very helpful to us like, I mean, yeah I scrounged just, for information and what I did <laughs> what like I even, did find was helpful but I could have done with a lot more help now did you have to whip them along and say Rick keep this move and we're, you know, we're, you're yeah. wasting light yeah <laughs> yeah one or twi- once or twice I produce that's what producers do right <laughs> yeah bearing in mind in 48 hours you can't do a lot of producing uh, no that's, that's the that was the big kind of thing for her to get more of an experience as a producer there's not there's like I mean, there's only so much you can pre-plan when you don't know what yeah. anything's gonna be. So it'd be it'd be nice to have. And I, we said I said this to her before we we did it, like the three days before we started the the 48 hour thing. Was it, it would be nice to have a, a nice solid little short film that we really like as a story that we want to tell. And then take that and take it through the stages of pro- yeah. or producing yeah. it, so you can really <laughs> practice that craft of 
producing a film from beginning to end and knowing all of the elements that are involved within it. Because you get it crammed in the 48 hours, which is a great kind of quick snapshot of it, but it's not enough to give her, uh, you know, to give the full, full on experience of how actually each, you know, how much pre production it takes, mm -hmm. how much, you know, we could, we could gather as much as we did, and we did a, a fantastic job. Like I was gonna, you, you had mentioned earlier about the wanted poster. We didn't know what genre we were gonna get, okay. right? And uh, we had talked about the genres. There were 13 to kind of that you could receive, and then there were eight more that were wild cards. So if you chose, if you got a, a genre in that first 13 that you didn't like, if you tossed it back in, you'd get one of these wild oh. cards, which were more specific, and I'd say slightly more challenging genres than the other ones. They're a little more, you know, rather than just being a wide open right. comedy. It was like dark comedy. Or, um, that's not quite right, but something along those lines. Okay. And so we had talked through all the genres and kind of discussed what we do, how we're going to do it, you know, as quickly as possible, as cheaply as possible, <laughs> as whatever, right? Our next door neighbor had this clock cow skull with the horns. And so when we got Western, it was like, okay, get the cow skull. Because <laughs> if I've got nothing else, that cow skull is going to be in every single shot of this movie. And it'll be about the cow skull being moved by actors. But we were really fortunate to have actors who happened to have some Western gear. We had our neighbor. We had our friend Marianne Newman photographer and works in film to gather up a bunch of props and pieces and stuff. She brought us a saddle, which is a great story about this. We'd finished writing the script. It was about two o'clock in the morning. The DOP and the editor had gone to bed because the four of us kind of wrote it together. Mm -hmm. and I did a lot of the typing, but we kind of fleshed out the idea together. And then Nadia came to me at about two in the morning and said, look, we've got a saddle. The saddle <laughs> has to be in the film. Make this saddle in the film, put it in it. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm looking at the script, I'm like, okay, all right, so uh, Paul will carry it in at the beginning of the film, and now I have to justify it. So at the end of the film, when she's crying, he'll say, hey, babe, did you see my new saddle? <laughs> and it'll be like a sweet moment, right? And so, you know, wrote, wrote the, you know, a through line for the saddle character, and, uh, and that's kind of how that, but that's, and I, you know, and I think at that moment, I realized that we could work really, really, really well together. Yeah. In it. We'll so. make another film for sure. Awesome. Yeah. Just not in 48 hours. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Take a little more time. Now Wait. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. It can be done. Five days. Yeah. Done. And now that you've directed, you know, the short film, is there any desire to go back and direct an episode of Lost Girl? Because we would be remiss if we didn't talk about Lost Girl. Yes, of course, we must talk about Lost Girl. <laughs> yeah, no, I'd love to direct an episode of Lost Girl, Jay Firestone, Wanda Chesney. <laughs> I, I would love to, probably not for a while, like maybe next year or something like that. I mean, I I know I know what I don't know as a director <laughs> that I would need to know in order to, to direct something like television. Yeah. Like with feature films or with a short film, you know, you can take your time. And features generally, they do like five pages a day. So you can take your time talking things through, making sure you get eyelines right. Make sure you don't crossing access, you know, simple things like that. Yeah. And then do more complicated, you know, big setups or whatever. With television, it's 10 pages a day. You really need to know your equipment. You need to know your lenses. You need to know what you're talking about. Or you need those people in place mm -hmm. that know what they're talking about to say, no, <laughs> this is a 75 millimeter lens that you need at this point because it's a, it's a close up or whatever. Right? Mm -hmm. And I am learning that stuff just from being on set. Yeah. There's, there's, I'm aware of what I need to know. Still, the more I need to know. You'd like to write an episode? Yeah, and yeah. That, that would be that would be my next step yeah. is to kind of and and I've I've talked to them about. He's like, well, write a one pager and get it to us. Yeah. So, at this point, all the episodes are written for this season. So, oh, of course, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, it, so if we get a go ahead for next year, then I'll you know I'll I'm gonna try to come up with something. Yeah, we, I read in an interview where you said that if you did write a story, you'd be afraid you'd give away too much of trash. Well, like I was saying to somebody the other day, it's kind of like uh, it's like Cheers or Frasier, right? It's like you don't want to you don't want to know who. Norm's wife, like mm -hmm. what she really looks yeah. like, and once that bubble gets burst, yeah. it's over for yeah. you, right? And tricks, tricks, sort of in that bubble in a way. Yeah. yeah. Where if you let out too much information, it kind of it could burst yeah. in a bad way. But at the same time, 
you know, you, the audiences are going to learn a lot more about tricking this season, especially just before Christmas. Oh, tease, you tease. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so this you get is to, before we have to wait a month yeah. for, it to <laughs> for it to come back. Yeah, for the next part, for the next half. But yeah, so I'll, I'll probably I'll put a little more attention to that when we're over over the next break, if there is a break and not just like end. <laughs> <laughs> there has to be. There will be more. There no, the next yeah. alone, like that room filled. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and that was a and that was, that was a hoot. Just, uh, that was so yeah. much fun. That had to be like such an experience because we got there first thing in the morning and we said, okay, the only thing we have <laughs> on the go today we is washroom. That That's all we're doing today. So we thought, you know, it'll be in this room. It'll be half. Maybe three quarters full of So we got there like we were in the front row. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, it's great. And, hey, kidding, uh, it's great to see smiling faces at you. Like, and, I'm and terrified. <laughs> and we're just sitting there and we're watching it fill up before you guys even got there. I'm like, holy crap! I mean, this is going to be insane. Yeah. yeah. So to come in from the other side, what was that like to to get that rush? Oh, it was lovely. It was amazing. I mean, it's you know, it's rock starry. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there is a lot of love for that show. Yeah, there yeah. is, there is. And it's, uh, like, a, like I've said many times, and I will continue to say, I feel absolutely blessed to be given the opportunity to play Trick and to be on this show and to be so successful. I mean, you know, you spend years as an actor even just hoping for a pilot yeah. Yeah. of a show to get a character on a pilot. Yeah. And then to have it go, and then to have it go again... It's like, you know, now I'm afraid of what's going to happen when it's over. It's like, oh, I don't know how to audition anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's pigeon only. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then, can like, I be another all-knowing, <laughs> being? Is I there another it. part for me where yeah. I can, yeah. Yeah. And then you guys sat for three hours signing autographs. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. No, happily. We could have we kept going. They actually yeah. kicked us off. Like, they were like, yeah. we yeah. got to stop this now. Because right I got down, down there fast. Yeah, because I, I left all you guys yeah. behind. Because I stopped you and Anna and Ksenia. Yeah. And you, uh, you said happy birthday to Amanda for me. That's right. Yeah. And then we rushed downstairs and there was already line. Like, yeah. Hi. Right. And I jumped in with one of the guys for, that knew me from the Zeman That's show. That's right. Yeah. yeah. That didn't see me inside it was, right before it started, yeah, and uh, he yeah. was like way back in line. We were already outside the, the little the roped off thing, area, the, yeah, the cattle area. And but on top of that, though, that you guys took your time with everybody, and not in a bad way by making people yeah. wait, but you gave your attention to each and every person yeah. that came up. I mean, we're all very did. thankful yeah. for for it's, for people watching. Absolutely. Yeah. I remember Anna said, thank you guys for coming. I'm like, thank you guys for coming. What are you talking about? I'm so yeah. happy. Yeah, Anna's from Fredericton as well. I know. I, and we're going to try at some point to kind of approach her and sit down with her and say, did you know we're both yeah. born in the same hospital? Is that weird? <laughs> Is that okay that we're talking about that? <laughs> now, what, I saw you at uh, FN Expo. Mm -hmm. What did you think of it? Cause you say my not, mind. Yeah, because you're, you're not never, a big sci-fi fan. No, so. I've never experienced anything like it. Yeah. I was not the strangest looking person in the room for once. <laughs> not even remotely. No, no. <laughs> it, was, it was wonderful. It was weird and wonderful and it was, it was it blew my mind. I mean the love for the for what, you know for the for the characters and yeah. for the shows and oh it's just amazing. I mean I'm going back next year in costume. Good for you. Yeah, yeah. excellent. Oh cool. Seriously I mean I like the costumes. Mm -hmm. That kind of commitment was just amazing. I loved it. Yeah. And it was too bad you guys couldn't be there for the whole weekend. Because uh, I know Zoe came for a bit on Friday. Yeah. On the Friday. And signed. And even she had, like, just by herself, had, like, this lineup of people. Oh, yeah, she's got aisle. a fan base. It's enormous. Yeah. It's Her and Anna both have enormous fan bases. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, Casey and I were going to go on the Thursday to sign. But we both ended up booking or being scheduled to shoot. Yeah. Oh yeah. So it was just yeah, it was, it was, was a hectic a period. Photo or something yeah. too, I think, and then uh, that, yeah. that got next year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, next year, day. next year it should be enormous. I mean, Anna's gone to Sci-Fi Expo in San Francisco, and she went to one in Florida as well, and had a huge response before the show's even aired. Yeah, that's brilliant. Say. Which is amazing. Just wait. <laughs> so. You know what I think. And is then hopefully, I will be going to those as well next year. <laughs> <laughs> oh please, oh please. Yeah. Do you know what I think? What's really amazing is coming from somebody that's not one of the cast, so it's not a, like a PR thing. Is the cast are really genuinely happy to be there? Yeah, that was yeah. the impression we got. You yeah. know, so this yeah. is not a put-on kind of thing. 
Yeah. You know, it's not just a really good PR job. They are yeah, really, really genuinely happy to be there, happy to be yeah. there and and appreciative of yeah. all the of all the they really are. And, okay. and that that makes me feel good. You know, yeah. it's not a big PR scam. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, really, we actually really all really are. like each other. We got the, yeah, and the, we get along really well. It was amazing because you could just tell the way you all rip off one another. That yeah, it's it's got to be it's got to be a happy set. It's an incredibly happy. It's like and like I said before, I think actually I think after Bone Cup Bad Cup, I think I said to people that was the best set I ever worked on, and then after Lost Girl, it was like that was the best set I ever worked on. And seriously, it, it Lost Girl is like I mean, the crew is incredible. Like David Green, who's the, our director of photography. Lighting designer, the sweetest guy you'd ever met, and everybody is. I mean, everyone's so right from the top all the way down. Like Wanda, Des, the production manager, is, like they're just lovely people that bring you into their warmth, bring you into their into their world. They're like Mary. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're it's like, like it's like a whole crew of Marys. Yeah, <laughs> and a whole cast of Marys. And I'm, I'm like. I keep trying to figure out how to push for Mary to get in there. Oh, <laughs> that would be I know amazing. she would be amazing on the yeah. show. And, yeah. I mean, she's kind of elven looking too. She'd be perfect. Totally. She'd be yeah. perfect. Yeah. No, I think it would be great to have her. But um, we'll push for it. We'll start a website. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and then, to talk about trick, I've noticed a couple times that there's a tattoo on yeah. your arm. Now, is that yours or his? It's a. Uh, it's his, actually. It's a really, it's really good ink thing. I just had this put on yesterday. Oh, wow. So, so that's a day old. It looks real. And I keep it on after shooting just because it doesn't wear off right away. It keeps remarkably well. Yeah. Because I've seen it a couple times, and, and we talked about it the other day. We're like, okay, there's just odd questions we want to ask. I'm like, is the tattoo his? And, <laughs> and then I had the weird question. And this is just going to be a weird question. <laughs> Because I grow my beard in every now and then, and I, it can last for like maybe five to eight months, and then it gets to the point where I've got to get rid of it. It just drives yeah, me yeah, batty. Yeah. And do you get rid of yours? Do you keep it? Um, I have shaved it off. Yeah, when when I go somewhere warm, <laughs> uh, which we won't mention where. Just yeah, I shave it off when we're not when we're not shooting when we're outside yeah. of the outside of the the shooting season. I I generally do. But I mean, I like it. It's, I, I'm used to it. it. It doesn't bother me at all. Um, I keep it quite trimmed. Yeah. They keep it quite trimmed. I always thought it's kind of, it's almost, I keep joking with the hair people. It's like, I want, I want you to trim it the same length as my hair <laughs> so it's all the same length. All, all the way so that way that the action figure will look more like me if I ever get one. <laughs> You know, remember G.I. Joe's? Because the G.I. Joe's had the yeah, same hair, yeah, like, yeah, beard all, all the way around. Yeah, action figures. Yeah, like, yeah no, I would love... I just saw that, too. I'm like, oh, man, that would be amazing. Yeah, yeah I think and we should have a trick action figure. Like, like, with the dowel. Wow. And yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> my layer with my little... Yes. All my Ooh. stuff. It and a clothing line, too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. The Kenzie. Well, there is, a, there is a clothing line called Kenzie, isn't there? Is there, I should be. Isn't there already a Kenzie Kenzie clothing line? Just have wigs around. And yeah, that would be awesome. But yeah, so tattoo is fake, but it's you know I own it <laughs> when it goes on. Very cool. It's tricks. The, the the tattoo and the watch and the vests. The vests. Yeah, I love the vests. The, the I was feel. gonna wear one tonight, but I'm thinking nah, I might get the wrong impression. From <laughs> no, no, it's all right. Because waistcoat. Yeah, I love a good vest. But yeah, it's interesting that we brought up uh, Ksenia because your chemistry, the two, the chemistry you two have, is fantastic. Yeah. And you can see the relationship developing in the first season. And now, have they started to cater to that more in the second season by writing more scenes for you two together? <laughs> we have scenes together. Yeah, we just uh, just shot an episode that that uh, we're together a little bit more than normal. So nice. you get you'll get you'll get a highlight of that after Christmas. Yeah. Oh, that's a long way. <laughs> yeah, she and I both kind of say to each other. I love doing those scenes with you, <laughs> and we both we both say like we we share that, and, and it's great that that translates yeah, off, it's, off it's the that, screen. Yeah, it's, those tend to be my favorite moments. It's yeah, just the two of you playing off one another. Yeah, there's yeah. this. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I, there's a spark that kind of happens between us, and there's this I mean, care and stuff for each other. Yeah, and yeah. Whatnot. She's got this secret handshake with Hale, but <laughs> she's got like this. I mean, she'll go to the doll now on her own. She doesn't need Bo. Yeah. She doesn't yeah. go yeah. there to see anybody in particular. She goes to. Like sob to the bartender. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Pretty totally. much, usually yeah. crying your beard. Yeah, no, it's we have a yeah. We both feel the same way. We love the scenes. We love doing them. I mean, I like 
like working with everybody is fantastic. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, 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 I don't have a single complaint working with anybody. And but like you know, and but we're working with each of us. It's, it's a little different of a dynamic with each person. Yeah. I mean, I'd like. I'd like to see a few more scenes with with Zoe, you know, yeah. with Trick and Trick and Lauren, because that would be a lot of. Their, yeah, they had just, one last week where you guys yeah. were sitting at the yeah. table and I'm yeah, like, kind yeah. of. She was, and I was yeah. thinking, you know what? That's I think that's the first time you guys have actually had a full scene. Together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had like the one or two. Like and there was one at the very beginning of this season where she's looking at my hand from the end of season one. Oh, yeah. yeah, and yeah. she's like, "Wow, you hire, you know, feel remarkably well." And, had a little kind of jokey liney thing there before everybody else comes in and the you know the plot, the, the plot takes <laughs> off. But uh, I tend to get it's cool too. I mean, a trick gets kind of tends to get these little moments with each character yeah. Yeah. across from the bar, commiserating yeah. whatever before kind of before the action of the yeah, scene takes place yeah, or yeah. before everything kind of yeah revs up. And uh, love those moments, cherish those moments with everybody. Now, is there any chance that we're going to see trick? Out of the dial and uh, maybe helping bow it on a case. Yeah, you'll see that a little bit. After Christmas. Because I like. I mean, that's that's the thing. It's like even even the, the crew. The crew is like you know whenever they they see me on location, it's not on in our studio. They're like, you're on location. It's so great to have you here all week long. It's like so great, and it's it's been a, a blast having. Uh, having the opportunity to get away, I'll have. I, I've already had a Caesar for the people who know about the Caesar. I'll have a, a bottle of Moosehead, please. Ooh. Okay, uh, Keith. Sure, sounds good. And then you and uh, and Casey and Mark. I've lost his name. Uh, have done a showcase podcast. Is it? Mark? Oh no no Mark? um no Steve. Yes yeah, Steve Steve, Steve Cocker. Where did Mark there come from? Yeah yeah we did a yeah we did them all in one day just kind of rattled off a bunch okay. of podcasts. He had ideas. Uh, Steve, Steve kind of ran the whole thing, uh, along with the showcase guys. Yeah, they just said, hey, do you guys want to do this? It was like, yeah. <laughs> a chance to talk? <laughs> Absolutely. And it, that was, they were a blast. Yeah, they were a lot I've of actually got to yeah. listen to one or two of them still. I'm a little, I'm a, I'm a bit behind on those as they've released them. Because, you know, you do them so quickly. And we kind of did two, and then we did a bunch, all the rest of them. And then we went back and did... A bit more of, of one and two, just to kind of like <laughs> balance it out a little bit. Yeah, just get the ball because we got the ball rolling. In. And then they say television and film is a, is a game of hurry up and wait. Yep. So what do you do while you're waiting on set? Me? Yeah. <laughs> I I uh, again sides. They have these like every day when you go on set, you have it's like a, they make a miniature booklet of the scenes that you're shooting that day with the call sheet on the front of it, so you know what the order of scenes you're shooting. Yeah. So you can kind of follow along. I hold on to those things dearly, and and because sometimes Trick has some pretty difficult speeches. I had one yesterday, and um, when they're not natural dialogue things, or if it's like a little more, it's not Shakespeare, but it's a little more um, formulated speech, and there's fey words. Yeah, well, there's fey words that don't exist in the English yeah. language, and I'm like. How do I say this? <laughs> and they've got them written about phonetically, occasionally, or you just do your best shot at it, and they go, "Yeah, well, that sounds good." <laughs> you know, no, that's not true. It's it's all it's all very um, what's that called? Dramaturge and research and things like that. But still, tongue twisters at times. So I I'm often kind of reading my scenes over and over again, playing the phrases, playing the words, saying the words out loud. But oftentimes. You know, having a sandwich, drinking a coffee, <laughs> shooting the breeze with KC or with anybody, with Kensinia or Chris, or it depends on who the scene's in or, you know, or who's guesting that week. Because there's always somebody in, you know, oftentimes I know them if they're Canadian actors. It's quite often that I, that I know who they are, and so you have a history with them, and so, you know, you introduce them to people and stuff like that. Thank you. But yeah, we just hang out. I mean, there's cast chairs that are set up usually when we're in studio and one wall, and so that's kind of where you end up hanging out, where they like to kind of keep yeah. you. Because they're also, you know, ADs basically try to kind of track us at all times. Know where you are, yeah. And uh, sometimes we feel like wandering. <laughs> sometimes you just got to tend one. You got to go to the bathroom, and so tend one, and you're out the door. And then you recently did an episode of Sanctuary. I did. Which uh, is predominantly shot on green screen. 
Yes. And in Vancouver. Yes. Yeah, so they flew out there from, to Vancouver. Yep, they did. And what's it like working on green screen now? Well, it's interesting. It's 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 like anything else. It's kind of CGI or anything else, really. It's like if you're acting in a scene and the camera's here, kind of facing you, and past the camera, off in the distance, there's somebody walking toward you. They're not always necessarily walking toward you. Not the, the vista that's there when the camera turns around and looks that way isn't necessarily there right. when it's looking at you this way. And so you have to envision all of that stuff. So it's the same kind of deal. An art director or a director or you know somebody who knows what's going on will explain to you what that visual is going to be, mm -hmm. what you're seeing. So you can kind of extrapolate on that, you know, in your mind. And I think that's part of the thing of, of being an actor is being able to imagine things that aren't there. You know, and it's, you know, it has to do with also like miming stuff. It's like, you know, on on one way that the camera's pointing, say I'm doing a scene with Ksenia in my lab, in my lair, you know, pulling a note or a, a piece of scripture out of a mouth of a rat, say, looking through a magnifying glass. And so, you know, at one point, she's like, she grabs the rat to hold the rat away from me, and really that thing is just like a cloth with a tail on it. And that becomes a living mouse in okay. post. Or it's a, you know, it's like the rubber mouse, and she's holding the rubber mouse, and then they animate yeah. the tail on it and make it look, or animate its head, or replace its head with a real head, or whatever. We both have to, that's a real, Rat. It's not a rubber squeak toy. It's you know it's a real skin. So I mean it's, it's all that. It's just, it's su suspending that de belief mm -hmm. uh, or suspending that disbelief. I guess is what it is. Um, you're suspending something. Yeah, you're suspending lots of stuff. As long as you're not suspending me, I'm okay. <laughs> so the green screen stuff was 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 cool. It was it was another you know another new thing. Yeah. And I mean you know you're working with Chris Heiderdahl who plays Bigfoot. Yeah. Holy cow, what an amazing man. <laughs> well, he's, he's, Bigfoot's even bigger than him. Like, he's, he's smaller compared to that character, like, I mean, or that, the costuming that's, that he wears. Like, I mean, he's, and he's, he's cloaked in that costume from yeah. morning till night. Like, full headgear, like, there's a chin piece that they remove. And that's the only difference. And he actually stays in character all day. Like, he, he keeps the voice and the voice that he's talking in. He talks lower and gravelly, and he stays in that character throughout the day. And so, my scheduling, like I, I flew out for a Friday, was there Saturday, Sunday, shot Monday, Tuesday, flew home Tuesday on the red eye, arrived Sunday, uh, Wednesday morning, picked up by Lost Girl Transport, and driven to set, spent 36 hours oh, dear God. on set, and then went home. So I was kind of tired by the end of it all, but it was pretty good. It's like, you know, that whole phrase of sleep when you're dead kind of pops into your head many times. It's like, all I need is a shower and I'll be fine, I'll be fine. I, I didn't, like, for the entire time that I was there shooting the show, and all of my scenes were with him, mm -hmm. he was never out of wardrobe or makeup. So the only the first time I, I met Chris Hyderdahl, the actor, was, and I hope I'm saying his last name correctly, was literally the, the last day of shooting on the Tuesday night. Wow. I get out of my wardrobe and makeup, and, and he happened to have, like I had to book it from the studio to the airport, to the plane, to get home, wow. to fly eight hours to get home for the morning, to shoot the next day for Lost Girl, and he had to fly to Calgary to shoot a, another show that he was playing a sheriff in that show. Wow. And so we literally came out of our dressing rooms at the same time, got into the same car, and he, had, he actually invited me to take his, his uh, limo to the airport with him. And, uh, and so that, that was, that, like, you know, that 35 minutes was the entire time of us actually getting to know each other as <laughs> actors yeah. and like who do you know who knows who and I mean he's he's good friends with Eric Canuel actually from the director of Cup Bad Cup he spent a lot of time in Montreal but uh, the, a sweet sweet man I was quite nervous I had we, we shot my uh, my scenes in reverse we shot the the, the reveal scene yeah. of the evil reveal scene first and so it was like okay I get to say three lines in the character that I prepared before this, mm -hmm. and then dive into this lower guy, like, tougher. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, 
and I was terrified. I was nervous, you know, first day on a new set, new yeah. new crew, new director, lovely director, Lee Wilson, who's the uh, special effects coordinator for there. Nice. And uh, really nice guy. I feel like I've met him before, but I don't know if I have, but he was really supportive. And Chris gave me a little thing on that first day, because I was quite nervous about it, and had a big speech. And he was like, you know, coming on set, eh? It's like first day of school, right? It's like you got a new teacher and you got new students around you and you gotta just kinda let it go and say, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm the new student. How are you? <laughs> and uh, and he just kinda put it into a into perspective for me with that little story and I was like, oh yeah, it's just like first day of school, cool, no problem, I can deal with this. Yeah, I've done this and it's like I've done that, yeah. And uh, but he, he had a he had an amazing knack of making me really, really comfortable. And I loved working with him and I would again he's he's another guy that man if I got a chance to act with him playing like regular characters uh, I would love, I would dive at the opportunity to work with him again. He was such a lovely guy. I mean, everybody's really nice. Amanda Tapping, I've known, I'd known sort of vaguely when she was from when she was back here in Toronto. She was, I think her and Paulino, who I'd mentioned before, had worked together or something, and somehow I'd met her, but she remembered me, from, and so we had a nice little chat in the makeup trailers. Robin Dunn is a really nice guy. He was in prep to direct the next episode wow. and it was his first directing of an episode so I was like ah so that's how it goes hey eh? fourth season fourth season right. you get to direct as an actor yeah. okay set my sights right. um, again really nice guy like everybody was everyone I met was super super nice to me and I had a blast I had an absolute blast um very excited I had to eat a giant sandwich yes. and, they, yeah. and they came to me and said yeah. you know what what allergies do you have what do you need what do you want what do you like I was like, actually, I really like the Quiznos all dressed. <laughs> and they had four or five of those things. Oh. And they emptied one and double stacked it, so it was like a Ooh. quadruple. Yeah. And, you know, they're like, we've got these subs. You only ate three of or like, you know, parts of two of them shooting it. So if you want one of these sandwiches, like, yeah, you know what? Wrap me up one of those big bad boys and I'll take it on the plane home. <laughs> so I ate this giant sub on the way home. Probably told the person beside me where I got the sub, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I had a great experience there. There you go. All right, to, to wrap it up, uh, what's next for you and what's next for Trick? Or the other Without way spoilers. Yeah, 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 I can't actually yeah, say exactly. what's up for Trick. I mean, stay tuned because you're going to learn a lot more about Trick for the next yes, for the second half of the second season. Yeah. Quite a bit more. You've heard a little bit in the last couple of episodes. Yeah, yeah. there's a mention starting of to come a wife up. Yeah. And, uh, and, yeah. and how he ended up in the situation he's now in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you get a little more, little more bits of that, uh, bits of those, those tidbits of plot from my character. You know, I, like, and like I said, you know, the episode that I want to write, it might be a, you know, I, really the episode that I would want to write is like a flashback of Trick and showing you all of that stuff that he did. <laughs> I think so. I think it could actually be a feature. But what's up for for Trick will, will be that, um, that kind of stuff. I don't know, you know, hopefully there is, there will be a season three. Like I said, we haven't heard, I haven't heard anything yet. If anybody hears, let me know. Um, uh, and I hope we do, and it'll be another really exciting, I don't know what they'll do, but it'll be another really exciting thing, and I'm sure it'll, it'll hinge more on the relationships of the characters and whatnot. And you guys are just getting the scripts as you film them now, right? Like, yeah, basically. As opposed to last year where it was all out of order, but now you're actually doing everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, we're in an order. Yeah, but even even last year when they're out of order, we were still getting them just before we were yeah, shooting them. So we weren't. Yeah. We didn't really know what episode six was going to be, even though we'd shot eight. Yeah. And that was a little bit crazy. It was. It was. It was interesting. It was like. I mean, it. It just. It meant there were moments before scenes would begin where the act, we'd look at each other and go, okay, so. You don't like me right now, and I kind of like you, but we've got that thing between us. Yeah. Okay, let's go. Let's do it. Yeah. And then just just to kind of place us in a in a in a place. But this year has been a lot a lot easier that way. Uh, and for me, there's really nothing on the on the on the boilers right now. I mean, we're gonna. I'm I'm always thinking about writing. I'm always thinking about recording. Going back mm -hmm. in the studio. So I think I think the next step will be one of those. Um, in our downtime. When I'm shooting, it's it's bizarre. I mean, like there are periods when you're down, like there's like a couple of days in between days of shooting and stuff. 
but there's not really enough time to get anything else. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and schedules change, and the schedule yeah. changes, and then, then they need me the next day, and flip around, flip around, flip around. So uh, your schedule isn't your own. It's 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 much more up to the to the production and to the to whatever needs to be done, and uh, and I'm all for being at their beck and call. I mean, it's they're 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 giving me a chance to to do my thing. So and pay me to do it, which is you know a blessing. Even better, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, writing a short for us to do, we got to come up with a nice story. We got to find a story. Although I I'm thinking that uh, on our travels this year we might find a, a story to tell. Yeah. Because I think we want to. I think also, um, we're both relatively politically active, not active, but mentally active, like aware. Mm -hmm. Politically aware, I guess is a better thing. She's much more politically active than I am, I think, uh, or at least has been in her past. And I think we're gonna we're looking at kind of getting back into that again, and so our films might take on a bit more of a of that cool. that kind of ilk. Possibly even start with a documentary, as most. Try not to get deported. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's that. Wrong yeah. that. What's under the skin in Canada? <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> perfect. Well, I think that is a perfect place to wrap it up. Uh, this was episode six. We were sitting with Rick Howland, Nadia Massey, my awesome companion, Sue Maynard. Hello! I'm Tim, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It requires a human female to complete it. Is this some kind of sex thing? What? No, no. Or like a virgin sacrifice? Because I don't think I can help you with that. No, 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 no. I'm not sacrificing anyone. Virgin sacrifice.